For a good while now, experts, including many of those appearing on this channel, have been warning about the lag effect of the aggressive interest rate hikes and quantitative tightening program conducted by the Federal Reserve and other major world central banks over the past year. These experts have cautioned that the speed and severity of these cooling measures would cause a sharp economic slowdown that could easily result in recession, deflation, and a material correction in the financial markets. But here in mid-year in 2023, the economy is chugging along at a 2% plus GDP growth, inflation remains at 3%, and the S&P is up 18% year-to-date, and the NASDAQ up a whopping 35%. So where's the slowdown? Were those predicting one wrong? Well, they weren't wrong, says Dr. Lacey Hunt, perhaps just a little early. But a credit crunch is now at hand that will indeed start freezing up the gears of the U.S. economy. To learn why, we've got the great fortune to sit down with Dr. Hunt himself. Dr. Lacey Hunt is a former senior economist to the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas, as well as several of the world's largest global banks. He now serves as Executive Vice President and Chief Economist of Hoisington Investment Management Company. Lacey, thanks so much for joining us today. My pleasure, Adam. My pleasure. Lacey, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Um, it's always a graduate level course in macroeconomics. I'm so excited to jump into it with you. Very quickly before I do, I just wanna give one quick disclaimer that this interview is for educational purposes only and folks watching, Lacey's not advertising Hoisington management, nor is he soliciting business for Hoisington here. He's just talking to us as a private individual and a very accomplished economist. Uh, with that out of the way, Lacey, uh, let's start, if we can, with a high-level question I like to ask all my guests at the beginning of these discussions. What's your current assessment of the global economy and financial markets? Well, it, it is true, as you said, we, we had in the two-something growth rate in the second quarter after similar growth in the first quarter. Um, however, I don't, I don't think that number is really very representative for a lot of the sectors. Um, uh, for example, the Chicago Fed uh, has a national activity index, which is weighted. It had, has 80 some odd different components in it. Um, and it's, it's declined for four consecutive months. Uh, only uh, 30 or so of the indicators rose in the month of June. Um, there are sectors that are gaining, important sectors that are gaining. Um, but there are a lot of areas of the economy that are weak. Um, the One of the things in economics is called a circular flow, well, which has been proven time and time again, which it, it, with what we spend equals what we earn. In other words, gross domestic income must equal gross domestic product. Uh, and uh, but they have different income streams. So consequently, over the short run, there's usually a, a, a significant statistical discrepancy. Well, uh, the gross domestic income uh, has declined in three of the last four quarters. It's, it's dropped in three of the last four quarters, even if we exclude the losses of the Federal Reserve. Uh, so uh, yes, the economy has continued to move forward, but the, the areas that are moving forward are becoming um, narrower and narrower. Um, uh, let me just uh, uh, talk about something that was very apropos to the second quarter. Um, the, the, as we know, or, or as we believe, according to the consensus, that the GDP growth rate was 2%. Um, and there were various components moving up and down. Um, however, I believe the controlling factor, the one that was the one that really permitted the second quarter to look good on the surface was what happened in automotive. Um, automobile assemblies, according to the Federal Reserve and their industrial production release, surged at just a hair under a 50% annualized rate. Now, the reason for this, in my view, is that this was the last major sector to uh, restore operations from the pandemic. They had various significant supply chain issues. And, uh, but in the second quarter, 
uh, they, they had a 50% gain in output and about a 10% gain in sales. And as a consequence, there was a very big surge uh, in automobile inventories and the inventory levels are now approaching 60 days, which is uh, very close to what the, the companies like to aim for. Okay, so here, here's the situation. Uh, at a minimum, directly and indirectly, automotive production and sales, the whole gross automotive output is, is at least 4% of GDP. It might be 5%. But let's assume that it's the lower number, 4%. 4% times 50% means that this one industry gave us a contribution of 2% to GDP directly. Which was, which, which was most of the number for Q2. <laughs> that is correct. In other words, it's it was the controlling factor. And um, even with this monumental uh, benefit, uh, the manufacturing sector, um, has declined at about a 1.3% annual rate since reaching a peak last September. And automotive output, which is your high multiplier, high productivity sector, uh, is a half a percent lower now than it was a year ago. Uh, another element in the picture is that the United States, even with the problems that I've mentioned, which are not generally acceptable ideas, uh, the rest of the world is doing quite poorly. I think it's fair to say Europe is in a recession. Uh, China is struggling badly. Uh, they, uh, Japan is doing poorly. Uh, and, and I think that um, I would summarize it by saying that the economy is far weaker than is generally recognized. Okay, economy is far weaker than generally recognized. And it sounds like um, if we look on the surface of some of this headline data, maybe we can tell ourselves that things look okay, but you're basically saying, one, you, you got to look at the full data set, and two, you got to dig beneath the surface because a lot of what's driving some of these headline numbers are maybe sort of short-term one-offs, right? We're not. We, I, don't, I don't expect you think we're going to get a similar boost to GDP in Q3 from the automotive sector. No, right? As a matter of fact, if you look at the automobile assemblies, according to the plans of the automobile companies, and uh, the plans always vary and there's monthly variations and there's a strike in the industry that's possible we don't but according to the plans automotive output is supposed to be flat for the rest of the year so you go from a 50 percent rate of contribution two percent of gdp in the second quarter to zero in other words it's not going to replay itself in the second half it's behind us okay so, so uh, the 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 very great economist uh, Ran the Bureau of Labor Statistics for a long time, George Moore, believed that one of the things keys to short term forecasting was to look at gross automotive output, gross GDP, and, and look at what was happening to the uh, non automotive. And then assume that the major swing over the short run came from the automotive sector. Now, automotive is not as big as it used to be, but it's still an important sector. And I believe. That what happened in the in the in the second quarter was really a reflection of a gigantic move in a major industry. I'm not saying it was not a negative. I mean, it was not a positive. It was a positive, but it's a non-repeatable one-off of positive. 